So uh, moving on, as we know, as we've learned, the, the uh, spine bone's connected to the hip bone, and in turn, the hip bone's connected to the knee bone, and we've got Dr. Eric Reitmeyer to give us an update on the knee. So um, this is a big topic, probably something we're going to spend all afternoon discussing, um, but I'm going to narrow it down to really the updates. I gave a similar talk last year, and there's been some new things that have happened even since then. So my background, mostly uh, local, uh, Boston area, I went out to San Francisco for my sport fellowship, and I also am board certified in both orthopedic surgery and uh, sports medicine. So starting again with some anatomy, the knee joint is uh, made up of three bones, the femur, the tibia, and the, and the uh, patella, four if you include the fibula. And sources of pain can be uh, among the articular surfaces, the tendons around the bone, including the uh, quad tendon and the patella tendon, can, and then injuries to the meniscus, uh, medial or lateral, and, the, and then the ligaments. There are four main ligaments, the medial collateral, the lateral collateral, the ACL, and the PCL. Uh, so sources of pain can emanate from any one of these. And the end stage is arthritis. And what we mean by osteoarthritis of the knee is when the cartilage wears out. Uh, and in addition to loss of cartilage and loss of the joint space, you get degeneration of the meniscus and usually the ligaments and other structures as well. So there's a, a, a pretty s steady spectrum of injuries that begin with a healthy knee that end in this. Non-surgical management, generally speaking, uh, again, anti-inflammatories, rest, injectables, cortisone primarily, various different types of short and long-acting cortisones have become more popular recently, and hyaluronic acid still plays a role uh, as a way of treating inflammatory-type conditions of the knee. Uh, and then rehab plays a role as well. Our physical therapists are key in helping most patients by restoring full range of motion, improving their gait and regaining muscle control, particularly around the kneecap, um, tightening the ham loosening the hamstrings and strengthening up the quad can often improve a lot of these conditions. And then there's the patient themselves kind of can be divided into thirds. You have the, the copers, the adapters, and the non-copers. So uh, that plays into the man way we manage things as well. So it's a, uh, a lot of factors. Uh, surgical management, generally speaking, uh, becomes an option after uh, you've tried conservative measures and persistent instability or pain persists. There's actual instability on exam, so you can feel a loose uh, ligament, typically the ACL or uh, an unstable meniscal tear that's causing the knee to lock, catch, or pop, uh, so-called mechanical symptoms. Uh, and then an inability to return to uh, the activities that you want to be doing. So this is, again, patient dependent. Uh, not everybody needs their ACL to go back to doing the things that they want to do in the course of a day. Generally speaking, again, surgical management has evolved. Most procedures that we used to do open, a lot of these can be done arthroscopically or at least arthroscopically assisted, which means smaller incision, incisions, less post-operative pain, shorter hospital stays and generally speaking, a more favorable experience for our patients. Uh, so starting off with meniscal tears, um, there are various different types. You can have these, uh, the, these are sort of the more of the traumatic meniscal tears. That this is called a bucket handle, where you get a tear through the rim of the meniscus and then a piece of it flips into the joint and can cause the knee to lock. This is a typical high school, college age athlete injury. This is a flap tear here where you get actually a flap of tissue that can then move in and out of the joint like a pebble in the shoe. Uh, and then the radial tear here, uh, which can also produce more pain type symptoms. And then you have the um, more uh, chronic or degenerative type tears where the meniscal tissue just starts to wear out, usually associated with arthritic changes on the x-ray as well. And these can be managed a little bit differently. The traumatic tears uh, are either displaced or non-displaced. Some of the non-displaced ones can also be managed non-operatively. If this bucket handle, or more likely if this flap tear were to flip back into place and scar in and the symptoms go away, it doesn't necessarily require surgery. So, um, And then the degenerative tears, you tend to treat the arthritic condition more so than the, uh, or than the meniscal symptoms unless they're truly meniscal in nature. They're, uh, they're, the patient presents with dull, achy pain, you can assume it's arthritis. Whereas if it's uh, mechanical symptoms, then you may 
consider addressing the meniscus even though even if there are already arthritic symptoms or signs on the imaging. So this is what an unstable meniscal tear looks like through an arthroscope. Uh, this is a probe that you can pull the meniscal tissue away. This happens to be a bucket handle tear. Uh, and this is a flap tear. So you can see how these two could produce mechanical symptoms or pretty large pieces of tissue that can float around. And then this is more of a degenerative type tear, what a picture would look like inside a knee joint. Um, often, and you can even see some of the arthritic changes on the femoral condyle there. Uh, they can, so when it does become a surgical issue, they're debrided. These, again, primarily the degenerative type tears, flap tears, or tears that are in the uh, uh, avascular zone uh, typically get debrided as well. Repairs are reserved for a certain type of uh, meniscus tear that's usually in the younger patient, typically in the high school, college age, uh, and the young adults. Uh, and it has to be a, a sort of deep into the periphery where there's still a blood supply, so-called the red zone or the border of the red-white zone, where the white tissue is, is where there's not a good blood supply and is typically not repairable. Techniques for repair have improved. We now use these arthroscopic anchors, these little devices that have a stitch attached to them that you can push in through the, uh, the poke hole of your arthroscopy portal and implant a anchor through the meniscal tissue that has a stitch attached to it. And then you can implant a second stitch next to it uh, and then pull it tight, uh, sort of a slip knot. What it was historically uh, a procedure that required a large incision and a big recovery can now be done much quicker uh, with, with similar results and a lot less trauma. The time it takes for them to heal is about the same. Again, we have increased the rate at which these a lot of these injuries take to heal. Um, so moving on to ACL injuries, this is a another area of orthopedics that seems to be uh, expanding. The mean age is getting older. 29-year-olds is kind of uh, the, the more of the median as opposed to the mean. Uh, over the past, well, this is now a few years ago, um, and this trend has continued. ACL reconstruction has increased in patients over the age of 40 by more than 200%. Uh, the incidence of ACL reconstruction in kids less than 14 also has increased, perhaps even more, as we see kids getting started in, in pretty intense athletic endeavors at younger and younger ages uh, with very high um, competitive uh, nature. The graft types have always been basically divided into two types, the allograft, which is a cadaver, piece of a tissue from a cadaver, uh, typically either the, the Achilles tendon most commonly or this picture, it pictured here as a patella bone tendon bone graft. The alternative is a uh, autograft, which is taking a piece of the patient's own tissue, either the hamstring or the patella tendon, which are the two most common they were all considered to be equal up until a relatively recent large uh, expansive study that looked at thousands of patients uh, over time. And they did determine that there is a difference between younger patients, typically 25 to 30 and younger, do what better with their own tissue. So an autograph, there's actually about a 15% risk of failure for a variety of reasons, some of which probably remain speculative, but uh, has pushed us to use more autograph tissue. I use it almost primarily now in anybody um, in the you know, basically age 30 or younger. 30 to 40, we have the discussion. I kind of leave it up to them. And beyond that, um, the, the grafts seem to be equal in the older population. Other advantages of the allograft are that it's less surgery. You're not harvesting a tendon from somewhere else. The incision can be a little smaller. Um, uh, but advantage of the autograft is that it may incorporate quicker. You could perhaps push the physical therapy a little bit sooner, faster, which makes a big difference for a kid in senior year of high school who's doing their final uh, sport or uh, has other reasons to heal faster. Graft fixation has evolved. Uh, on the left is the metal screws that we used uh, 10, 20 years ago. These evolved into plastic screws that uh, may have produced less reaction among the, the, the surrounding bone. Problems with the metal screws were that the tunnels would sometimes expand, a condition that we called osteolysis, and the graft would loosen over time, or you'd end up with other issues. 
And then the most latest and greatest technology is the screw on the right, which is a bioabsorbable screw. So these screws are made out of biocomposite materials that actually dissolve and form bone. And these have pretty much eliminated that osteolysis problem that we've seen in the past. They also make revisions a lot easier. So here's an example of the bone patella bone autograph being harvested. My preference is actually the hamstring uh, because I think it's a stronger graft. It's a little bit easier to harvest, a smaller incision, and you don't have problems with the kneecap. With the kneecap, you're taking a big chunk of bone out, and there are some studies that have shown that anterior knee pain is more common and even arth arthritis of the kneecap or fracture through the patella. Uh, but the, the, these, they're considered equal. Osteochondral defects are constantly evolving. You may have seen some of our vendors out uh, in the area uh, discussing new technologies to deal with osteochondral defects. So an osteochondral defect refers to a defect in the cartilage that is not arthritis. It's simply a one hole or patch of arthritis that's missing where there um, should be cartilage. So the rest of the surrounding cartilage is normal. Traditionally, or my for, uh, for smaller defects, you can perform a, a, a procedure called microfracture, which involves using these little awls or, or picks, basically pointed um, instruments where you can, after cleaning up the defect, meaning removing the ragged edge of the cartilage or any unstable cartilage, and then removing the, the calcified layer, exposing the subchondral bone, you can poke little holes through that subchondral bone, which then accesses the bone marrow cells beneath then that layer that are like stem cells. So it's kind of the original stem cell therapy for osteochondral defects. This allows the stem cells or the bone marrow cells to seep through and form a clot, like a blood clot, but it's not a blood clot, it's a mesenchymal clot, which means um, cells that can differentiate and form cartilage. This works about 85% of the time. When that doesn't work, there are now new options. This is one of the original use of autologous cartilage, so taking a, a patient's own cartilage, growing it in a lab, and then filling in the defect and using a periosteal patch. So you actually harvest a little piece of the periosteum or lining of the bone to cover that defect with this patch and then inject those cartilage cells back into the patch and then that grows new cartilage. And it was great, except that it was a big surgery and had some complications and required two procedures because you had to harvest the cartilage, send it off to the lab to grow, and then come back to replant it. Now we're moving towards more single stage operations. This, also, this has also been around a while. It's called an osteochondral uh, autograft. So you're taking a dowel and removing pieces of bone from parts of the knee where, there, where there's non-weight bearing portions of the knee along the trochlea behind the kneecap uh, or elsewhere, making little dowels which you can then implant into the defect, kind of like a mosaic pattern or puzzle and these work, but have their pluses and negatives as well. And then for larger defects, you can even use um, allograft cadaver bone with the cartilage still attached to it. You can match it up and take a, a, the, the missing defect, find a piece that matches in a cadaver and replace it. And then there are the uh, 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 allograft living cartilage cells, which is what we've been, which I've been using more lately, which are from a donor, uh, this is actually juvenile cartilage that's still living cells that comes in a little packet that you can make in, mix with uh, fiber and glue and put into these patches as well. I uh, can't talk about a knee without talking about patellofemoral pain, one of the most common conditions we see. This is actually a pretty unusual procedure. It's an osteotomy where you can realign the pull of the kneecap relative to the quad and the tendon, kind of straightening the direction and also moving the, the, the tibia, tibial tubercle anteriorly. Uh, this is uh, not a common procedure, maybe becoming less common over time as we move more towards uh, partial knee replacements, uh, including replacing the patellofemoral joint. So that um, brings me to the robotics. I don't know if you saw the robot in the back of the room here, the Faco Mako, it's just the cardboard cutout, but we have a robot in the operating room now, two of them. Uh, that we use for navigation to do all of our total and partial knee replacements. So this has really improved um, the procedure in terms of precision. We're able to get things accurate down to within a degree or a millimeter, whereas before you're eyeballing things using jigs and potentially uh, being off by a millimeter or two, uh, which allows us to put in these implants, which um, are made of 
uh, metal and plastic, the materials are always improving, but the wear and so wear characteristics are improving. But one of the biggest causes of failures with these types of implants is malalignment. So once we're getting the alignment uh, down to within the accuracy that we get with a robot, these implants theoretically should last longer. And we're already seeing that pan out uh, in outcomes over time. Also, the uh, so the selection criteria equal preoperative planning has changed because you get a CT scan, which creates a three-dimensional model of the patient's knee, which you then into, uh, download into a computer. Uh, and then you can do all the surgical planning uh, in terms of size of the implant, where you're going to position the implant, how much bone you're going to cut. All that happens before the patient even comes to the operating room. Uh, and then the post-op care is, again, the same. This is what a typical screen looks like in the OR. The registration phase, you take a, a probe, you have an array in the patient's thigh and another one in the patient's tip, uh, shin or tibia. And after you've registered, the, this is, you go through a process where you are communicating with the computer. The computer knows that the patient that is in the room that you're registering is the same patient that is the CT scan. And you do that by popping these bubbles virtually with a little uh, wand. It's kind of like playing whack-a-mole. Uh, and then the, then you get your uh, first set of images. This is the patient's uh, knee, the real, all the lumps and bumps included. And then this is what the implant will look like after you've put it on. Again, this is before we've made a single cut in the bone. You can remove the implants, make sure the cuts are all where you want them to be, uh, and make sure everything's perfectly aligned. And then you bring in the robotic saw, and it's not actually doing the cuts. You still have to run the saw, but it's making sure you stay within the coloring lines uh, uh, and not stray outside of them. So it's really uh, leveled the playing field in terms of uh, knee replacement surgery and, and technology and made the results more reproducible. So in conclusion, as the population remains active for longer, the rates of orthopedic injuries continue to rise, particularly in the younger and older age groups. We're seeing younger and younger patients as well as older and older patients, particularly in a sports medicine practice. Um, and I, I take care of the patients from the moment they have their first meniscal tear up till they need a total knee replacement. Uh, conservative measures are still primarily the treatment in most cases. The you know, majority of patients don't have surgery. 19 out of 20 get better with uh, conservative measures. The surgical techniques that we are using in those cases where the conservative measures fail continue to evolve, becoming less invasive and more precise. So that's it.